Welcome to you all. For the Scientific Council for Government Policy, the WRR, in providing scientific advice over all policy domains, one question is always central. How to serve welfare and well-being of all people in local communities, nationally, and in international contexts. The next 45 minutes, the floor is to Martin McKee, and please turn off all other noises. So let me just set the clock running. I want to begin by thanking the Scientific Council for Government Policy for asking me to give this very prestigious lecture. And it's a particular pleasure to see so many colleagues that I've worked with over the years in the audience today. One of the greatest achievements of post-war Western, Western Europe was to provide security for its people. We had collective security from external threats in the form of NATO, but we also had security from internal threats, and these internal threats were, whoops, yeah, these internal threats were summarized in the United Kingdom by William, William Beveridge as the five giant evils of society, want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. And it was the struggle against these giants that was the basis of the post-war welfare state. But memories fade. The 1980s were a time of change, at least in the English-speaking world. Ronald Reagan became president of the United States. Margaret Thatcher became the British Prime Minister, and together they gave their names to a new philosophy, characterized by shrinkage of the size of the state, with privatization of state-owned enterprises and retrenchment of the welfare state. Here in the Netherlands, Ruud Lubbers was pursuing similar policies. It was much later that things really did change, and the year was 2008, and the cause was a sequence of events far away. The bottom line to all of this was that governments gave a very large amount of our money to save the banks, what we now call welfare for Wall Street, leaving none for the ordinary people. Many of those ordinary people had been coping up until then, but only just. The situation got much worse when their employers started laying people off, but in many countries, those who had enjoyed some degree of job security lost it. Now, most of those who lost jobs did ultimately find new ones. But when they did, the new ones were often very different. There was no more certainty that when you went to work on a Monday morning, you would be paid to work until a Friday evening. The term zero hours contract entered the vocabulary in some countries. What we are now seeing is a new class of workers a group of workers who do not have that control and whose lives are dominated by what we might call precariousness. Now, concerns about precariousness have become really quite widespread in the United Kingdom. So what I now want to do is to look a little bit at those in the population who are the precariat, or who at least have, begun, have become so. Well, we can see that precariousness is a complex, multifaceted concept from some of the ways in which it's been described. But what all of these have in common is that those whose lives are precarious face uncertainty in several areas, including employment, income, and housing. It's been linked to what has been described as the privatization of risk. Now, politicians often see this as a good thing. They frame it as giving individuals back control. And of course, it has intuitive appeal, but it can equally be interpreted as telling people that they're on their own. And a widely mocked example in the UK is David Cameron's Big Society initiative. Those whose lives are precariousness may be rendered vulnerable. It's important to note, however, that precariousness can cut across traditional classifications of social protection or class. Many of us here, and Johan Mackenbach is in the audience and others have done tremendous work in terms of looking at social class, the social inequalities in health. But here we're seeing something new. Individuals can be in a state of precariousness, even if they are well-educated and in employment, like the example of university lecturers I mentioned earlier. And of course, those people in conventional sociology, uh, social epidemiology would be considered as being in a favorable situation. 
Um, but the, the problem is that um, they, uh, the people at the bottom of the pile, they are particularly vulnerable because they have no assets to fall back on. Now, one contemporary example, which um, I'm particularly familiar with in my role as medical director at the London School of Hygiene, um, is that of junior doctors in the British National Health Service. Now, we can look at this by thinking about how job loss is associated with worse mental health and, in some cases, suicide. Well, we were able to look at this. We looked at the introduction of the minimum wage in 1999 as a natural experiment. And what we found was that there was a significant improvement in mental health, but only for those whose incomes increased by a few pennies. It was a very small increase, but what we found was that the impact, the magnitude of the change that they experienced was considerable, and it equated to what you would have found if you had put them on antidepressants. So it suggests that for people whose lives are precarious, a very small change can make a very big difference. But there's also precarity de travail, or precarity of work, precariousness of work. And we've been looking at the epidemic of workplace suicides in France, where increasing numbers of employees have chosen to kill themselves in the face of the extreme pressures they're facing at work. We can look beyond employment and income. Many other people feel precarious because they may have nowhere to live. Well, we took advantage of a natural experiment in the UK to look a little bit closer at housing. And, <clears throat> and this was from 2011, April 2011, when the government reduced its financial support for low-income persons who were renting in the private sector. And the impact was really quite substantial. Those who were receiving benefit, housing benefit were losing about 1,500 euros a year. And we compared mental health problems among those receiving housing benefit, who would suffer a loss, and those who did not receive benefit, who would be unaffected. Now, of course, given that this was in the midst of the economic crisis, it was unsurprising that even those who were spared the cuts experienced some worsening in mental health. But the change was several times larger among those whose benefits were cut. Now, the final area where I want to look at precariousness is the ability to feed oneself and one's family, which we might call, we keep with the French, precarité de la sécurité alimentaire. We have seen a remarkable increase in the, um, supply, the number of food banks in the United Kingdom. And um, we, uh, so I'll come back to that in a minute. But we were interested in what was happening across Europe, and we used data from 21 countries, and we found that food insecurity had increased between 2004 and 2012. And we could show when we looked at the natural experiments across Europe, this was clearly associated with uh, both job loss and with income reduction. Let me just pull all of this together so far. We've shown that the financial crisis and the subsequent imposition of austerity has impacted on people in many ways. An estimated 5 million European citizens lost their jobs between 2008 and 2010. Many others have experienced reductions in income. Many people have lost their homes, and if they haven't lost their homes, they've fallen into arrear. Although the data are not easily available, where we do have data, we can find that the numbers of homeless increased by about 15% between 2008 and 2010. Other people, shockingly, have gone without food. In all of these ways, people's lives have become more precarious. And as we've shown, this meant not only that they were at greater risk of misfortune, but if they are unfortunate that a disaster strikes, then the consequences are much worse than they were before. And of course, what we have described is only the tip of the iceberg. Many of those who have escaped these experiences live in constant fear of the future. Their jobs, their income, their housing may be secure for now, but for how much longer? They can still afford their homes. Will that continue? And if they have to move to get a new job, what will this mean for getting to work? Will they have to travel longer? Can they afford public transport? 
If you travel by train in the UK, you do not have an OV chip card where the fare is the same all the time. I envy you every time I have my one, and it is a great asset compared to what we have to put up with, where you may need to book your train weeks in advance to know that you'll get there at an affordable cost. And what will a move mean for their children's schooling? So we in our research have only just scratched the surface of this problem. We have shown that even a very small change such as a wage increase that most of us would not even notice can make a big difference to mental health. And in contrast, we've shown that a cut in housing benefit can increase substantially the risk of mental illness. And we have also seen the indifference of politicians to the plight of those who are living on the edge. Clearly, there's an enormous research agenda for the future. Now, I hope that I've convinced you that we should be concerned about precariousness. I hope that I've shown how it impacts on health of some of the most vulnerable people in our societies. But in the final part of my talk, I want to conclude by arguing that there's another reason why we as a society should be concerned about the growth and persistence of a section of the population who feel left behind in a world that for them is characterized by uncertainty. So what we did was to go through the archives and collect very detailed data, and we looked at voting patterns in the five Reichstag elections between 1928 and 1933. And we looked at a variety of measures of the economy. In fact, the very poor, the, lives who, the people whose lives were hit hardest by job losses, were not turning to the Nazis, they were turning to the communists. It was those who were just above them in the pecking order who turned to the Nazis. These were the group that had something to lose and whose lives really were precarious. If you're right at the bottom, you may not be precarious because you can't get any worse. So let me conclude. As someone who's concerned with the health of the population, and especially the health of the most disadvantaged, I must try to understand the impact on health of the changes that are taking place in society. And as a European researcher and I should stress that despite the suicidal policies or lack of policies being pursued by the government of the country in which I currently live, I am a committed European. I have the benefit of an incredible natural laboratory to study these issues. The growth of precariousness is not inevitable. While wages have stagnated in the UK and Germany, they've risen in Finland and Slovakia. But the common feature of policies that protect the health of populations in the face of adversity active labor market programs and policies to protect people against losing uh, people from losing their homes, is that they show ordinary people that those in power actually care. They actually care about them, and that's a very important message. But there's another reason why we should be concerned, and that's my final point. Our democratic systems are based on a social contract, and those in power those with the power should not use that power to breach that contract. Because if they do, we know the lessons of history, and we know that if they do, it can have consequences for us all. Thank you very much.